Borat TV. The world is thinking. It's very nice to have you all here in this final keynote controversy debate, the battle for leadership. I'm Claire Fox, I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas, and we were very keen to have a discussion on leadership here because um, when we were first thinking about the um, battle of ideas, we were considering the American election. At that stage, when we were putting together the programme, um, there actually wasn't, we didn't know whether it was going to be um, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, but there was a lot of discussion then in the public arena about what made a great leader, and Barack Obama was seen as a kind of new type of leader and so on. And now, obviously, we still have as our backdrop the American election about to be resolved. But we've also, um, as the time has emerged around the battle of ideas, uh, been faced with something of a challenging um, economic crisis. And one of the discussions that there has been around this was what kind of leadership we might need to get out of it, whether we have a leader that can get us out of it in this country, Gordon Brown's popularity in the leadership index, and the fact that there is one is something peculiar, um, has gone up since the economic crisis. He seems to be less of a ditherer uh, in this period than maybe before. And so again, it's prompted this discussion about what makes a good leader. Is Cameron a good leader? Is Brown a good leader? What are the qualities? Now, we, what we do not obviously want to do is to sit around and kind of say, well, it's somebody who's strong or it's somebody who's loud or it's somebody, you know, I mean, it's not kind of that kind of competition. But we want to take a step back and just think about the issue of leadership. So it's a very open discussion, and I'm, I'm going to um, uh, let my panel sort of talk for seven, eight minutes each. Um, I did want to draw your attention to the fact, though, when I was writing about this uh, um, uh, last year, that as an indication of the fact that whether there is a crisis of leadership in politics and society or not, what there isn't is uh, any silence on the question of leadership. Because in 1970, there was only 137 academic, published academic works on leadership. In 1990, there was 1,000. And in 2007, there was 30,000. So as an indication of the fact that even if it's the case that we don't know what a leader is anymore, everyone is obsessed with leadership. And many of you will have undoubtedly been on those leadership courses, and I'm sure we'll hear more about them as the debate unfolds. So let me introduce you to the panel. Those of you who have been here um, all day um, will know the format. Um, those of you who haven't, and this includes my panel, I will just kind of vaguely explain it. I'll introduce you in the order in which you're speaking. I'll then have a very short discussion up here, but as you know, and at this stage in the festival, it really is an open discussion uh, with you. It's not questions, it's a dialogue. So we'll take three or four uh, points, see whether the panel wants to comment and so on. All right, so let me introduce my panel. The first person who's going to speak is uh, Brendan O'Neill. Brendan is the editor of Spiked. Spiked Online, as people will know, um, are um, uh, partners uh, of the Battle of Ideas and have been since our inception. And Brendan is not only the editor of Spiked, which is a brilliant uh, uh, magazine worth reading, but his journalism is widely published in the New Statesman, Spectator, The Guardian, The Catholic Herald, The American Prospect, Salon, Christian Science Monitor, you name it, he gets published, let alone the fact that he's never off the airways. And he's, I suppose, largely regarded as a passionate defender of free speech. Um, he's been described as a smug shite by, uh, <laughs> by gay rights activist Peter Tatchell, exceptionally ignorant by the Daily Mail's Melanie Phillips, and entertaining in a Julie Birchall kind of way by Richard Sanderman, who nobody's really ever heard of, but anyway. Um, and uh, I have... It's just that I, he said something horrible about me once, so I'm getting him back. <laughs> if you're in, Richard, you're a lovely chap, really. Anyway, um, he's, he's the author of the latest erudite tome, Can I Recycle My Granny?, uh, it, it, writing as Ethan Greenheart. So can we give a big welcome to Brendan O'Neill, please? <laughs> Our second speaker is Professor Alison Wolfe, the Sir Roy Griffiths, Professor of Public Sector Management at King's College London, visiting professorial fellow, I can't even say it, at the Institute of Education, executive editor of the International Journal of Assessment and Education, 
Presenter, as many of us will know, for Radio 4's analysis, where I always find her programmes um, really thought-provoking. She writes for a wide range of publications and think tanks, uh, largely on education. Um, her books include Does Education Matter? Myths About Education and Growth, which if you haven't read, you must read. It's almost compulsory in the Institute of Ideas. Um, and most recently, uh, Diminished Returns, How Raising the School Leaving Age Will Harm Young People and the Economy. And as Alison said, I don't necessarily know anything about leadership, but the thing about Alison is she's always interesting on everything, so we thought we'd get her along to see what she made of the issue. So that's a setup if ever there was one. Right, next we have uh, Major General Andrew Ritchie. Uh, Andrew, until 2006, was the Commandant of Sandhurst and was responsible for the selection and training of all the officers in the British Army. He was, 34 years indeed, a career soldier. He's now the director of Goodenough College, uh, the International Postgraduate Residential College in London, where last year we actually organised a number of debates in the build-up to the Battle of Ideas um, uh, at Goodenough, and indeed many of the students from Goodenough who've stayed in Goodenough over the years have helped organise uh, the Battle of Ideas, and um, we are absolutely delighted to have Andrew here. Can we give him a big welcome, please? And finally, we have Sarah Sands. Sarah Sands has a long-running journalistic career. She's been the features editor of the London Evening Standard, the Saturday editor of the Daily Telegraph, the editor of the Sunday Telegraph, the consult consultant editor at the Daily Mail, and is now editor-in-chief, and this is the exciting bit, of Reader's Digest, which I know many of you have, because there's loads of them downstairs that I've seen people re walking around and reading. Um, and she's also the author of three novels, and we were very keen to have um, Sarah and somebody from a journalistic background like this, because obviously one of the big issues is always how politicians are described in the media, how the media deals with who's leading the country and so on. So can we give a bit, very big welcome, Sarah? I, ha I have to say, Sarah also deserves to be commended because... Um, uh, Peter Oban was meant to be joining us, but his journalistic career took him abroad um, at, at the very last minute. Sarah stepped in, and so it's, a really, it's always hard to actually do that, so we're delighted you're here. But also, in the Reader's Digest, they've actually done a specially commissioned look at attitudes to the American election and the uh, um, people standing in the American election, which is very pertinent. So um, actually do pick up a copy of Reader's Digest, but thank you especially to Sarah for standing in. So, I'm now going to start, and um, I'm going to ask Brendan to kick us off. Brendan? Uh, thanks, Claire. Um, last month, the new Labour government launched its new graphic warnings on cigarette packs. You know, it clearly felt that those huge worded warnings about how smoking will kill our babies or make us impotent were no longer sufficient, so now cigarette packs will also come with uh, graphic photographs. Uh, photographs of diseased lungs, blackened teeth, uh, even open-heart surgery, all designed to shock us out of our filthy habits. And in order to uh, sell these new graphic warnings to the public and to convince us why they are necessary, the government sent its health leaders to interface with the British people. So up and down the country, various directors of public health made statements, held press conferences, gave interviews to the media... For example, in Buckinghamshire, Leslie Manning, the local public health official, declared, we welcome the introduction of picture warnings on tobacco packaging, which shows smokers the grim reality of the effects smoking can have on their health. In Derby, Mike Sandy, the local director of public health, also made a public announcement. He said, we welcome the introduction of picture warnings on tobacco packaging, which show smokers the grim reality of the effects smoking can have on their health. And, you know, of course, Liam Donaldson, who is the chief medical officer, was the national spearhead of this new warning campaign, and he gave an interview to the national newspapers in which he said, I welcome the introduction of picture warnings on tobacco packaging, which show smokers the grim reality of the effects smoking can have on their health. Uh, and on it went. Across the country, uh, the leaders and representatives of the public health system all sang from the same press sheet. There was no nuance in their statements, no local colour, no conviction, just the kind of robotic repetition of a statement that had clearly uh, been written by a dog's body at the Department of Health and then uh, dispatched around the country. Now, this was really leadership by facts. And for me, this episode shone a light 
on the crisis of leadership in contemporary society. It highlighted three major problems with leadership today. First, it, firstly, it demonstrated the extent to which leadership has become an entirely functional thing. You know, today we don't really have leaders, we have functionaries. The British politics is swarming with individuals who do leadership by rote, who are obsessed with the style and skills of leadership rather than with its substance. You know, they've learned the mannerisms of leadership, whether they've opted for the stuttering Blairite earnestness or Brownite seriousness, but they give little thought to uh, the message of their leadership campaign or to what they are leading people towards. So in the campaign to sell these new warnings against smoking, none of the public health leaders seem to have thought about what they were saying because leadership today is simply about using the right tone of voice, the right gestures, uh, the right level of seriousness to sell an already agreed agenda. Secondly, uh, the smoking episode shows how today's leaders view the public as subordinate. You know, they view the public as something which has to be led by threats and warnings away from its own stupidity. You know, it's fashionable these days to uh, handpick from history some extreme examples of leadership gone wrong. You know, whether it's Adolf Hitler or David Koreshi, in order to show, in order to show the old-fashioned leadership the pre-Blair kind of leadership uh, was about brainwashing people and leading them astray. In fact, serious political leadership has always been a two-way relationship. You know, it's always involved the leader, the inspired and inspiring individual, trying to convince people through ideas, argument and debate that he is right. And it's always involved sections of the public weighing up his arguments, judging them against others and then deciding whether to follow him, not as sheep, but as active agents. You know, the masses of people who followed Robespierre in the French Revolution or Trotsky in the Russian Revolution or Martin Luther King in the civil rights protests, these were not uh, passive followers. They were engaged subjects, made more engaged by their leaders. You know, leadership, leadership was really about drawing forth people's potential. You know, it was about igniting and exciting people's own desires. It was a real relationship. Uh, today, as revealed by the smoking episode, our leaders view us not as subjects to be convinced, but as objects to be poked and prodded and remoulded and corrected. You know, in fact, the new graphic pictures on cigarette packs really reveal how the government's, government views its citizens today as flesh and bones, blood and cells, you know, as potentially diseased bodies. And the role of leaders becomes... Uh, the role of leaders becomes to scare us uh, into changing our ways or to cure us. You know, this is a relationship. It's uh, the relationship of a paternalistic authoritarian uh, doctor to his patient. Too often today, leadership is about offering therapy to an apparently sick or confused public. You know, from Bill Clinton's declaration that he can feel our pain to New Labour's politics of behaviour to Barack Obama's promise to uh, make Americans feel better about themselves, leadership is no longer about leading an engaged public to the good society. It's simply about making people feel good or healthy or at least guilty. And you, thirdly, the smoking episode shows what is really lacking in political leadership today, which is any orientation towards the future. You know, according to my Oxford English Dictionary, to lead means to go through, to pass. You know, leadership has generally meant moving towards something, towards an imagined or a desired future. Today, however, our leaders seem, seem stuck in the present and stuck in the mundane. You know, they limit themselves to fixing or talking about fixing uh, what they consider to be the pressing problems here and now. And, and, you know, in, in New Labour's behavioural and anti-smoking agenda, what that really means is relabeling the problems of society as problems that spring from the personal or psychological defects of fickle citizens. Devoid of any social vision or future orientation, our leaders uh, simply obsess over uh, personal behaviour, over our self-esteem, our smoking, our shopping habits, and so on. You know, even in response to something as serious as the current economic crisis our leaders seem hamstrung by short-termism. You know, they come up with injections of, a, of cash to save banks, but they seem unwilling or unable to institute any more serious or longer-term measures to try to stabilise the economy. You know, and the House of Representatives initially rejected the American bailout package, 
seemingly because some Republicans were pissed off by a statement made by Nancy Pelosi. That really showed uh, that the extreme short-termism and changeability of contemporary leadership, when our representatives can change their stance from one minute to the next, depending on what kind of mood they're in. So ours is an era of functional leaders. And that reduction of leadership to a simple function is really captured by the rise and rise of leadership skills. You know, these courses which teach people the tools you need to make a difference. In every college and workplace these days, individuals are taught leadership qualities, as if leaders can be constructed, you know, separate from any debate or contestation of ideas, merely by sticking together the right attitude and mannerisms and voice protection and so on. And, you know, the rise of leadership skills courses, I'm pretty sure, exactly mirrors the decline of real leaders. But just finally, there's a second kind of leader today. Because people recognise that our short-termist functional leaders are not satisfactory, we've started searching for what we see as genuine leaders or passionate leaders. And unfortunately, the people who have risen to the fore are just as problematic as the functionaries who rule over us. So today we have the emergence of celebrity leaders who want to raise awareness about the environment, Africa, bad health, and so on. People have embraced Al Gore as a better alternative world leader to George Bush. Um, you know, Bono, the lead singer of U2 and the dictator of Africa, uh, has been a- taken on board by the G8 as a kind of rep- cool representative of African interests. But this cast of l- new leaders is also aloof and cut off from people's concerns. And in fact, because they're so removed from public concerns, they can act as megalomaniacs. You know, Bono recently said, I represent a lot of people in Africa. They haven't asked me to represent them. It's cheeky, but I hope they're glad I do. And final comment. And uh, (laughs) these, these leaders do talk about the future, but in an extremely narrow way. They continually warn us how dire the future will be if we don't change our behavior now. And in that sense, the future is used as a form of blackmail against people in the present. That is the very opposite of real leadership. It doesn't enthuse people to realise their destiny, but uses an imagined terrible destiny to make us meek, unquestioning and disempowered in the present. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Brendan. Nice provocative start. Uh, Alison, your thoughts? (coughs) Claire's right. When she asked me to speak today, I said, I don't know anything about leadership. Um, What I didn't say is, people have asked me to talk about leadership before, and what I've discovered is that, actually, as far as I can see, almost nobody knows anything about leadership. Um, You go to the library in my own university, King's, and there are shelves and shelves and shelves of books about leadership, and I actually spent a couple of days once trying to extract something from them, and failed utterly to come away any the wiser than when I'd started. But... I have become aware of a very deep paradox, at least in the area of life that I know, which is government, public services, public management. We are obsessed with teaching leadership. We have leadership colleges, we have leadership courses, we have leadership diplomas. You know, you you name the, 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 the second bit of it, it's there, it's got leadership stuck in front of it. At the same time, what we have created is a world in which no one ever takes responsibility. In fact, what people spend a very large part of their time doing, and I I have to speak particularly for the public sector here because that's what I know, is covering their backs, making sure that whatever happens, they cannot be held responsible, and that whatever happens, nothing can be their fault. Now, this is, I have to say, a a mystery, which I'm going to come back to at the end. I mean, it is a mystery. Why do we, is, is the reason we go on about leadership a sort of displacement activity? Because we're sort of conscious that things are not functional. We displace this worry onto the idea that, you know, if we all go on leadership courses, it will be all right. Or is it something deeper? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll come back to it at the end. But I also want to tell you a a, a story about a piece of research in which I was involved because it also brings home, I think, the issue of what leaders can do and what leaders can't do and why we actually may want to believe in them so much. And it's to do with schools and the idea that what really makes a school succeed or not succeed is its head teacher, its leader. And this is something which um, policymakers have hung on to very hard ever since they first found a little bit of evidence, a small bit of evidence, it might be the case. And it's one reason why we have national leadership centers for teachers and, and so on and so forth. But some very impressive 
people that I know at the University of Durham, did some interesting work looking at whether or not a change in head teacher was one of the things that made a significant difference to how schools perform. Now, the very idea that this might not be the case tends to make people go, oh, but don't you know so-and-so? Or what about X? Or I had this terrible head. Or there's Sir William who's turned the school around. Well, yes, of course, there are extraordinary individuals at one end or the other. But what this research found is that actually for the vast bulk of schools, for the schools of the country as a whole, whether or not head teachers change does not seem to make any difference. It just doesn't seem to matter. Whatever it is that's making a school do well or not, changing the head doesn't seem to make any difference. You don't get half of them shooting upwards in performance and half of them shooting down. It just doesn't seem to make a difference. And that's the point at which I sort of come back to the, the area of life, life of which I, I do know something, which is, which is management, a much less exciting term than leadership. Everybody likes to think of being a leader when they grow up. People don't say, when I grow up, I want to be a manager. <laughs> but it's nonetheless what we mostly are. Um, and there are some very, very interesting studies that look at what managers actually do. And there's a whole list of them. And you look at what people actually spend their time doing. And they spend their time being a figurehead. And they spend their time liaising. And they spend their time monitoring. And they spend their time being a spokesman for the department. And they spend their time handling disturbances. That's number one. And allocating resources like who gets the nice office. That's number two. And every now and again, at the bottom, they might actually get to be a leader for a little while. But what that actually tends to involve is interpersonal activity, motivating people. Now, it's very, very important to be able to motivate people because insofar as your position gives you power, it's your ability to mobilize that power to get people to actually do what on paper they are told they ought to do that makes a difference to how you implement it. But it's a very small part of what you do as somebody near the top of an organization. And it also has a very small part to play in how well that organization actually operates. Because what actually makes an organization operate really well is not just how you, the person at the top, behave and function, but how the whole organization functions. So, you know, one of the other things which tends to drive me nuts is this sort of constant harping on about, you know, teams are what matter, teamwork is what matters. Um, all the same, it is true. Organizations work to the degree that everybody in them is competent, and also, which brings me circling back to where I started, to the degree that people are clear about their responsibilities and do things. Now, I'm certainly not going to talk about um, the military situation when I have Andrew along the, 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 the table from me, but I think it is the, it's the, it's the image that we carry and it's the image we carry because these are situations in which what one individual does is so obviously and visibly something that makes a difference. But of course it's also true, as anybody in the military will say, that the degree to which what the officer does actually bears fruit is a function of how competent everybody is further down the organisation. And so that brings, you know, that, that, that brings us back to what is it that we think we lack. Why is it that we're all hung up about leadership? How is it that when people like me study large public organizations or anybody else who works in one talks to me, the feeling is that nobody ever takes responsibility. Nobody takes a decision which might put them in a blameworthy spot. Everybody spends a huge amount of time covering themselves. Government regulations are all meant to make it clear that when something goes wrong and lands on the minister's desk, it wasn't his fault. And politicians also say to you, I have no power. I can't get anything done. And I think it, that the reason we hanker after leadership is because we are aware of a deep malaise in many of our organizations. That we have, in fact, for all sorts of reasons, created a situation in which it's not only that the leader is pulling on levers and it doesn't seem to make any difference, but that a great deal of the time the people within the organization feel as if they're pulling on levers and it doesn't make any difference. And for that reason, I have to say, Claire, I am very pessimistic. I think there are some very, very serious problems in the way that we have organized a great deal of our society. I think that what I've called the regulatory state is indeed out of control, costly, and difficult to reverse back from. I don't, unfortunately, think that leadership is our solution because actually what we think of as leadership is by definition abnormal, and what we need to fix is the normal. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Alison. Andrew, your thoughts, please. Uh, Claire, I'm, I'm perhaps something of the straight man here, uh, uh, as, a, as a former soldier, talking about military leadership. Um, um, uh, uh, Sorry, yeah. Can you make, move the mic down? How's that? Is that better? Um, but I, but a, a number of strands that we've heard already, um, I think, will be mirrored in, in what I have to say. The army has a pretty simple view of leadership. It involves getting others to do what they don't necessarily want to do. Put another way, leadership is the projection of personality and character to inspire people to achieve uh, a desired outcome. Uh, when I was... Um, at Sandhurst, Tony Blair came and gave um, a, a, and took a parade. And just before he was due to make an inspiring speech uh, to the cadets, his press secretary let loose the media, um, who were there in, in some hundreds, um, onto the parade square. Uh, and they were going to completely get in the way of what uh, the Prime Minister was going to say. And uh, Tony Blair looked at me. Um, almost nervously, and I looked back at him slightly nervously, um, because these, uh, these media people were not where they were supposed to be. And suddenly, from left flank, came the stentorian tones of the Academy Sergeant Major, the senior Sergeant Major in the British Army, who said at the top of his voice, Stand still, the media! <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I don't think uh, the gentlemen and, and ladies of the press had ever been addressed in that way before. <laughs> But do you know, every single one of them stood rooted to the spot. They had no idea why, but they knew they had heard a commanding voice. They had experienced the projection of personality and character, and it had inspired them to bloody well stand still. But it is, of course, quite straightforward in the army. Um, we are a hierarchical organisation. We talk in terms of a leadership trinity. We talk in terms of the leader, the led, and the task. And generally speaking, all three constituent parts are very clear in a way that they're often not clear in a, in a civilian context. And we practice what we call action-centered leadership. We talk in terms of maintaining the team. We've heard a bit about that. The leader and the led together through loyalty. We talk about developing the individual, whether that be the leader or indeed uh, the, the, the led, uh, which inspires trust. And we do all that in order to achieve the task. And we focus very much on the outcome. And the outcome is, generally speaking, pretty straightforward, not necessarily easy to do. But whatever the politics of Iraq and Afghanistan, I think most people would uh, acknowledge that there have been some amazing things done by some remarkable people, many of them, most of them, um, uh, under the age of 25. Um, and the military tasks in those theatres of operation, if not the political tasks, are pretty straightforward. In training military leaders at Sandhurst, we find it helpful to think in terms of three components. First, the physical component. Leaders must be competent, and I think that applies in any walk of life. They must be competent in order to inspire confidence. In the military sense, they must not only be competent in the basics of soldiering. A young officer must be at least as good as his soldiers at his job, which is perhaps not true in other walks of life but they must also be competent in the tools of leadership, in how to communicate, how to motivate, how to inspire, how to set an example. And they generally do that by leading from the front. The second component is the intellectual component. Leaders must be able to deal with complexity, with uncertainty, with chaos even. And it involves this intellectual dimension, not just what we call the hard skills of leadership, courage, willpower, uh, risk-taking, and so on, but also the softer skills, um, self-awareness, empathy, creativity. Field Marshal Slim, a great uh, leader in the Second World War, described leadership as just plain you. No bullshit, but intense honesty. And the third uh, component is the moral component. Uh, not necessarily in, in the most um, obvious sense, but in the sense of having character. Leaders must have character. 
They must develop that character through experience. They must possess integrity. They must possess humanity. They must have, and I know it's an overused expression, a moral compass. They must know right from wrong. And they must, and we've just heard this, take responsibility for their actions in good times and particularly in bad. A quick word on whether military leaders, indeed all leaders, are born or made. It's an old chestnut, but let me just address it briefly. Uh, and the answer is, of course, they must be both. In the military, we're pretty hard in our selection process. Um, people, youngsters heading for Santos, go to a selection board, and a lot of them do not pass a three-day course because we do not see that spark of leadership in them, rightly or wrongly. Some people are not born to lead, and maybe, maybe uh, there is a view around that everybody can become leaders if they read the manuals. But having, having identified that spark in whatsoever way we do it, we then do believe very firmly that leadership, given that spark, must be trained uh, and must be developed through experience and what have you. Manuals absolutely and emphatically are not enough. Well, how does this read across to the political and business and academic spheres? And with uh, some nervousness, I'll offer you three thoughts. The first is that leadership is much more than management. Both have a place. But to quote Field Marshal Slim again, leadership is of the spirit. It is about personality. It's about vision. It is an art. Management is of the mind. It is about methods. It is about processes. It is a science. Uh, management skills are necessary said Field Marshal Slim, leadership skills are essential. Thus, leaders must have substance in themselves and in their ideas. Process is not enough. My second point is that leadership is about trust, about integrity, about loyalty, as you've heard me say, to those they lead and to the task in hand. And to do this, they must ad adhere, leaders must adhere to a set of shared and accepted values, values or ideas. These are either inherited in the army, uh, we have a, a set of values, um, or they may be created for a particular organization or for a particular time. But whichever it is, a leader must calibrate their decisions against these values or these ideas if they are to succeed. And they will only succeed if they carry their people with them. And my third point is that styles of leadership are important. I think I differ um, from, from our previous speaker there. Uh, and the context will dictate. Uh, my leadership style uh, running a postgraduate college um, has become, slightly through bitter experience, different to my leadership style in the army. <laughs> one, one, one small example, if I've got time, may suffice. Um, we recently decided, for reasons I won't into, go into, to sell um, uh, uh, some, uh, a bit of real estate belonging to the college. Um, it, it, in the military, the very idea of asking a soldier whether his clapped out brick tent of a barracks should be sold or should be kept left, left in the army, I mean, would be, would be just, just be greeted with such derision. Um, they really couldn't give a tinker's cuss. Um, so I went ahead um, and thought that would be the same uh, with a bunch of highly intelligent postgraduates who are very committed to the college and its estate. So styles do change, and context is important. Um, uh, but I think those styles must always be based on a bedrock of values and qualities and not the shifting sands of spin and process. Thanks very much. Thank you. Barack Obama, who I think um, Andrew uh, must agree just fulfills the sort of very definition of leadership, that it's about spirit, that it's an art, it's personal charisma in his case. And he's also getting people to uh, vote in what is an act of faith. They actually know very little about him, um, there's no great record, um, and possibly they're voting against their own interest. It may be in higher taxes, it, it's certainly unfamiliar. Um, so, so there is someone um, that, that we have who's perhaps one of 
of the uh, most extraordinary leaders that we've seen in recent times. I'm also interested that actually he replaces someone who's a strong leader. Um, you may uh, dislike George Bush, but he was certainly, he took decisions. They may have been disastrous, but he took them. Um, you know, he, he, he was accountable. He took responsibility. Um, uh, he didn't... He didn't um, uh, outsource in the way that um, we're talking about today. Um, so, so that's a, sort of one example. The other, um, these are afraid just sort of random last minute thoughts, but in, in the context of this week, um, that the bit that I picked up from this introduction uh, was this sense of whether authority is now being outsourced to the public. And I did think a, an interesting example in the past week, of course, has been the BBC, where we've seen an outsourcing of authority. We've also seen a total collapse of leadership. Um, it's quite extraordinary what's happened at the BBC. And it seemed to me that it started uh, by this idea that you, were, you, just, you just gave in to public taste. It was quite clear that most of those BBC executives had no idea what was being broadcast in their name. You know, they just, they just didn't hear it. They didn't know, you know, about these late night comedy shows. They'd sort of knew that stand up was what young people liked and they, they bunged it on. Um, and the interesting thing I did think was um, that often happens when you, uh, you, you start with an assumption rather than a conviction is that, um, uh, rather amusingly, it turned out that actually it was the young that, that weren't mad about this kind of thing, that thought that uh, uh, Jonathan Ross was just a dirty old man rather than this really sort of hit creature. And um, so and it was the Guardian websites of all places, you know, that were, were the most sort of condemning. Um, so that, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, and I also thought it was interesting, though, that having, uh, if you are broadcasting this, um, this kind of thing, you, you know, you have to believe in it. And what happens is that they completely caved in once, you know, the Daily Mail was on the attack. Um, actually, maybe the, the sort of the, the, the leadership um, thing to have done would have been to stuck to your guns and said, no, I really think it's funny. You know, I like it. I'm going to carry on. So actually, was it, a, was it an act of um, just cowardice that they, that they gave in in the end? You know, and that made me think a bit about leadership. The other thing that um, uh, was interesting about the BBC to me was that there was obviously a very, there was a completely structural failure of leadership. Um, one thing um, Andrew would know about is that chain of command. Um, and first of all, you had this thing called the BBC Trust, which had taken over, um, as I understand it, from the BBC Board of Directors in order to, to have a little bit more authority, that the BBC directors were seen to be um, too pally. Um, so you had a BBC Trust who had no more authority. Um, so everyone was left looking slightly sort of useless. Um, and you then had this extraordinary sort of structure within the BBC that you had producers who had no control at all over the presenters. Um, there was a, a list in um, one of the papers today of how many uh, very, very highly paid executives, all called director or something, content vision, um, tons of them, all on very, very high salaries. And yet not one of them seemed to have any control over what was going on. Um, so I thought that, that, that was interesting. Um, and the other thing was that, uh, the, the, so how you resolve it. And interestingly, it demanded some kind of act of honor. I think the two people that came out quite well actually were Russell Brand, resigned. Um, Leslie Douglas resigned. And uh, somehow that made you feel sort of better, um, you know, even if it didn't solve anything. Sometimes it just sort of calls, because if you haven't perceived the crisis, you know, you, you need to have some kind of sacrifice. Um, so I think that made feel, everyone feel uh, better that there was a sort of Carrington moment um, in that. Um, the, the other um, aspects of leadership, I suppose, that just sort of strike me um, in, a, in, a, um, in, in terms of this week um, is Gordon Brown is one person that we have been watching um, in, in a, a sort of fabulous um, um, journey of leadership, that this was someone who um, w was accused not very long ago of having no leadership, of, of dithering, being unable to make decisions, of being sort of pathologically gloomy and weird and couldn't work with anyone, couldn't inspire anyone. And then what happened was not that he changed. No, he still looks as unhappy and sort of as if he hasn't slept. But suddenly it's a good thing. You know? And the reason it's a good thing was that circumstances came to his aid and that, you know, do you need a situation um, in order to become a leader. And, you know, what this poor man was crying out for was a financial crisis, and it just came. You know? And it was everything he wanted, and so suddenly he looks like, you know, this massively sort of strong leader. Um, and, and, you know, Cameron's just shifting sands. And so um, that made me um, uh, think about it. And even there was a piece by Michael Portillo in the Sunday Times today saying, um, you know, but this guy caused the crisis, that, which is another thing, of course, that helps Gordon Brown is he's very good when things are... 
um, rather complicated and no one really understands them. And so this crisis suits him particularly well. Um, so, so people who, who understand it may say, but, you know, but he did this wrong and, he, and no one cares. You know, he's just, um, he's a, he's a strong leader. Um, and the other, I suppose, aspect of leadership that we've witnessed is in, uh, in business, where there does seem to be a total um, um, abrogation of responsibility from business leaders. And we've seen um, something, I think the buzz phrase is that people have been traders rather than builders, and that what we've seen is sort of short-term gain and personal self-interest um, overriding, you know, absolutely roughshod everything else. Uh, we've seen, again, uh, something that Andrew mentioned, that there has to be a relationship between the leader and the led, that you're seeing that they're taking the same risks and facing some of the same conditions. And what seems to have happened, you know, in the city, um, and actually in, in, in a lot of businesses, you know, for instance, that um, used to get bosses, I think, that were paid a sort of multiple of about 10 of their workers, and suddenly it was 100. And uh, so you had, you had people who really had no stake in the company Company, didn't live like anyone else in the company, didn't understand um, any of the um, long-term concerns of the, of the company. You know, they, they, would, they, had their, they had their money and, you know, they, they were out of there. Um, and that's how you um, also, um, w what you had is, um, in, in this financial crisis, is that the, it seemed actually a little like the BBC, was that um, there was the power of, you know, the trader or the presenter or the star, that there were these people and there was a sort of mystic faith put into um, uh, and what these people did, that, that the presenters could give you young people, the traders could bring in money, and so that the executive chain stopped asking questions anymore. Um, they just, it would be rather like bearings. They just, they, they, they just stopped, stopped thinking about what was going on. And that seemed to be very bad leadership. And one final point I would just, which is a question, um, just coming back to, to the um, introduction to this debate, is whether it's possible to have leadership where there's no deference, where there's no hierarchy. Um, and that's something that, you know, we've sort of celebrated with the um, democratization of the internet and so on. But um, you do need some symbols of leadership. You need some respect for office. Um, and I'm sure, again, that, that, that's something you would see in, um, in military terms. And so is it, is it, are, are we now um, too democratized um, to, to, to actually have proper leadership? Thank you very much. Okay, um, a, a wide range of a, a very interesting reflections there. So I just want to uh, run over some things. Actually, I, I'm going to start where uh, Sarah ended on the point about possibly deference, authority, those kind of questions. Um, because the bit that was kind of in, in, implied but not actually explicitly said that, that Andrew in Andrew's story was that there was a rebellion because he didn't ask the students if... Um, that he could sell it off. And as you all know, and, and in fact in, in new leadership theories now, they say there's a new leadership paradigm from hierarchical to horizontal. And one of the things that I know was discussed earlier today is that often people who are, who maybe in the past would have been seen to be uh, very strong leaders in workplaces um, can now be uh, rebranded bullies. Um, there is a kind of sense in which actually there is, a, you know, the idea of being the decisive leader from the front isn't necessarily going to get you brownie points and everything is kind of teamwork and consultation and listening to what the voters want and so on. Brennan, just asking you, I mean, do you think that's created serious problems, which is something Sarah implied there? Uh, yeah, I think, firstly, just on uh, Sarah's point, I th I, there is a difference between deference and uh, real leadership. You know, real leadership is something that has to be won. You have to convince people. You have to bring them on board. Whereas deference or tradition or hierarchy just assumes that people will follow line, you know, toe the line, follow what you say. So there is a difference between those two things. Um, and, but I think, you know, Claire's right about the culture of bullying. You know, the crisis of leadership really springs, I think, from a crisis of belief and a crisis of ideas and a lack of substance to these things. And I think that kind of crisis of belief even impacts on the military, actually. You know, I agree with Andrew that, that uh, military leadership is more coercive in some ways than other forms of leadership. But if you just look at the military after Iraq... You know, uh, Tony Blair, our political leader at the time, you know, he refused to use the word victory in relation to Iraq. He refused to have a victory homecoming for the soldiers of Iraq. He was really shamefaced about the political endeavour that he, um, he had uh, taken part in. And that had a real palpable impact on military morale, on how individual soldiers felt. 
Coupled with that, I think what Claire's talking about, the kind of idea that strong leadership or winning people over is bullying or brainwashing, that has had also a real impact on the military as well as other areas of life. So, you know, you now have all these scandals where people are investigating bullying in the army and, you know, uh, it's all about empathy and letting people say how they feel. I think those two um, trends, the kind of crisis of belief, the crisis of ideas, the lack of substance added to this idea that kind of uh, anything that is a strong leader is, is a bully, have really impacted on all areas of life, including the military. And any thoughts, Alison, on any of this? I, I was thinking in the education thing, um, that in, in, about Ofsted asking pupils to um, judge the quality of their teachers, um, and often it feeling as though the person at the front has actually got to shut up and the power is elsewhere. Sorry. Um, yeah, I- I actually think that it's... I, I was thinking about something slightly different, though. I'll come back to Ofsted and, and, and this sort of classic thing about we're going to empower students. No, they're not. They're not going to empower students at all. I mean, what actually goes on in schools is, is determined by 750 directives, programmes, laws and all the rest of it. And, yes, all that asking pupils things d- does is make the teacher feel even less safe in, in, in doing anything. But I, I do want to come back to this, the, to, to actually to Obama, Because in a sense, what we have with him at the moment is what the great Max Weber called a charismatic leader. And that's sometimes wonderful and sometimes less wonderful. But it's actually very different from the sort of leadership that somebody has to exert once they're in office, once they're in a hierarchical organization. And I want to come back to that point that I made earlier about what you do when you are a leader is intrinsically personal, and that's why I completely agree with with Andrew, but it's about realising the power that's the potential power of your position. If you're a leader in a hierarchical organisation, in something that's sort of set, as opposed to a charismatic leader addressing crowds, you do indeed have to realise your power through the sort of person that you are. And and it is a critical part of making an organisation work. And it does seem to me that, not that it's impossible, um, Mrs Thatcher did it, um, but that in many ways we have actually made it harder for people to do that. And you know, taking the American example, f- you know, again, you think of somebody like FDR who was actually able to mobilise all the organisations of state um, and contrast him with Clinton, who also had a majority and who failed utterly to... to to get things mobilised when he was trying to put his health care reform through. Now, I actually think that even in, the, in this country, even in the last 20 years, we've actually made it much harder for people to do that, partly because of all these attempts to make things horizontal, because of the, the acres of regulation, because of the determination to consult at all times, rather, even if it's a fairly fake consultation. It all puts brakes on action. It puts brakes on implementation. It, as I said, makes everybody further down the hierarchy pretty unwilling to be mobilised. And I think that what has actually happened in schools is, is in fact, continuing my story, I don't think the reason that it doesn't seem to make much difference who the head is is because the head doesn't matter. I think it's because it's actually very hard for most heads, if they're not incredibly extraordinary, to do anything. Um, I, I, I just wanted to... Um, I don't know if you can pick up on anything, but I specifically wanted to talk, Andrew, because you talked a lot about character... And I, it's not that I want to be dismissive of that, but I suppose I'm, I'm slightly nervous about it too, because the reason I'm saying it is because uh, one of these uh, things that, that, that uh, Alison has been talking about, the Centre for Applied Leadership Research, and it's, you know, it's like one of these, yeah, um, anyway, uh, one of these, uh, anyway, there's a, there's a, it's one of these things you couldn't make up, but anyway, they've got a leadership centre, um, it's in, been commissioned by the Department for Communities and Local Government, to do a project called Next Generation over the next two years to investigate, quote, the psychological characteristics associated with excellent political leadership. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating because I thought, there's nobody mentioning, like, what the politics might be. Uh, or, you know, so you can imagine all these people, this study is going to go on and get a lot of money, and you can imagine this checklist. And it, in a way, it will have things like courage, or, you know, I mean, it'll have all the things that which we'd all recognise. And yet... I was thinking, you couldn't really, as Sanders, be going around with your checklist. One well, well, might be worried if you were. Um, because, you know, it just seems so process-driven, that. So is there not a danger that you were actually playing that, when you were emphasising character, that you were playing that psychological, psycho-babble game, even, possibly? Well, I, uh, I, I hope not. I mean, there are more, more, more um, adjectives about leadership than you can shake a stick at. 
And um, I, I absolutely agree that, that t it, leadership is not about ticking boxes. But I, I think I'm talking about character in a very fundamental sense. Yeah. I, mean, I'm not, I, I mean, good leaders do not have to be charismatic. In fact, they're putting up a barrier almost immediately if they are too charismatic, as perhaps we're seeing in the, in, in the American election. But, it, but it, is, it is the more fundamental aspects of character. Um, I mean, I talked about you know, perhaps rather a Jack and Jill way, shifting sands versus bedrocks, but, but there is a bedrock of character. I mean, you know when you meet somebody who's got character, I believe, I do, um, and, 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 and from that comes respect. Uh, and, and, and it's about self-belief and self-awareness and so on. So I mean it in that, in, in that more fundamental way. Can I, can I though, yeah. um, just address um, Alison's point about um, how difficult it is, perhaps, to be a, a leader? I mean, I do blame the Human Rights Act um, for this. Um, <laughs> there is so much talk now about <coughs> rights and so little about responsibilities. And it does feed to this consensual approach. You know, we must give them their rights, their right to speak, their right to, 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 to have a say, and so on. And, uh, and I think the weaker leaders do abdicate the responsibilities. But I think there's now a sort of framework within this country which, 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 which ducks from responsibility, in a sense. Um, and people should, I think, people are reaching out, pe people wish to see strong leadership. May I give one example? Uh, and, it's, and it relates to the BBC. Um, I, I was involved in something in, in, um, on, on, the, on the radio with Greg Dyke in a very sort of small part, a sort of bit part way. And, um, and we went to Broadcasting House to, 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 do, to do this recording. And it was the first time Greg Dyke had been back into Broadcasting House since he'd been sacked. And I'd never been in the place before, so he sort of, sort of showed me the old studio and stuff. And word very quickly got round, Greg Dyke's in the building. Greg Dyke's in the building. And shed loads of people came to the, their office doors, shook him by the hand, how are you, Greg, and so on. Now, he may have made some mistakes, but he was a leader. And I just wonder, in the last week, if, this, if what had happened had happened in his time, um, he, he would have just um, remained on holiday with his children, important as children are, and not taking a lead. So, I mean, there are leaders around. There are plenty of leaders around. We just need to, uh, frankly, empower them a bit more and get rid of the Human Rights Act. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a very, that's only a very, only no, it's a very nice conclusion to come this. Um, I, just, just finally, Sarah, pick up on anything, but I suppose the, the broad uh, questions that I'm, I'm sort of throwing out, and I think Alison put a real challenge, because I think it is... It's even difficult if you organise a discussion on leadership that you don't end up saying, and what we need is leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, where are the leaders? And it sounds like some sort of mad clarion call. You know, are you out there? You know, and all the rest of it. Are we setting up a training course next and all that? Um, because I think maybe what the crisis is, is not in leadership. And all, I agree with all the regulation and all that. But I think that... I do think, and this is going to sound even more banal now, Institute of Ideas, at Battle of Ideas, says crisis is in ideas. But, I, but I, I think that one of the things that really strikes me is nobody knows what to lead around. I mean, there's even a bit of this with the army, and I'm not particularly suggesting, but the army is an idea, if you see what I mean. I mean, that is a very clear idea. If you join the army, I mean, you're not just kind of mindlessly being a leader or a follower. You're not actually, when you can say you can train them to follow some... But, but ultimately, you join the army, and the army is the idea. Mm -hmm. And um, you can then say it's an idea I don't agree with or I do agree with historically and so on and so forth. But, it's, but it's, it's got a very big idea behind it. And in some ways, that seems to me to be the problem almost with politics or with education or something, which is, is that if you have an idea and you want to implement it, I mean, at some point, some types of people have the imagination to try and make that idea come alive and to lead and persuade other people of the strength of the idea and so on. It just seems to me that everything is just far too petty now. And if anything, the ideas are almost like about the process. You know, they're just not, there's just nothing there. So in, I just, I suppose, it, all of the things, I really loved all your stuff on the BBC and youth and everything, but it's almost like what's really lost at the heart of the BBC is they don't know what they're doing anymore. Mm -hmm. so there's plenty of leaders there, probably. Yeah. But they don't know what to lead. Yeah. I mean, so I just wondered any thoughts or reflections on any of this before I go back to the audience. Uh, well, it was a small point, but I think attribution of ideas is or that sometimes you don't like an idea because it wasn't yours. And I think um, that, I've, I think, has come up a bit over the city academies, which I happen to be a great supporter of. When you said, um, Alison was saying that um, 
that a head doesn't necessarily change a school. Well, um, I, I certainly went to one um, a couple of weeks ago where within, nine, within less than a year, you know, results had visibly gone up. Parents who wouldn't go near the school were suddenly, bringing their, were suddenly appearing with their children. They were coming to parents' meetings. They were being accountable. There was a trophy given out, which had never happened before, and there were children. Um, you know, I went to an art class where they were preparing some art for the Tate Gallery. You know, suddenly the expectations, the rise in expectations was sensational. And the reason you could do it was because you just had one person saying, well, I'm, I'm going to be in charge, I'm going to do the money, you know, and it was a sort of complete handover of power. But of course, you know, you've then got a government saying, but it wasn't my idea, you know, it was Tony Blair's idea, so I don't like that idea. So, and, um, you know, I would certainly notice, I mean, you know, in the smallest way in, in journalism, one, one thing I noticed with a good editor is not actually the person necessarily coming up with all the ideas themselves, but someone who can spot ideas in other people and be generous. Um, and generosity is, um, is, is sometimes quite a hard <laughs> quality. And if I can just make one, one small point in answering Brendan actually talking about that leadership um, has to be earned. You know, I st still come back to these sort of symbols of leadership that I still think, you know, it was a, it was a big thing when it was teachers towards doctors, towards those sort of figures of authority, which makes it quite hard to actually say, look, I just think I know best on this one, you know. That <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, anyone wants... Oh, my God. <laughs> right, okay. Right. Right. Uh, yes, quite a few. I can see, obviously, the person at the back has stood up and wants to speak. It's a ready mic. Good. I thought I'd say I'm back. Thanks. Um, oh, hello. I think we've, um, over the past year, we've uh, had a global masterclass in the absence of leadership and, um, and the consequences of that at the political level because our, our political elites, uh, and I excuse nobody here uh, in, in terms of what's going on in the world, have, pr have been reactive and incoherent in their response to the unfolding world recession. And the fact that Gordon Brown uh, has emerged as a leader, apparently, in, in this process, indicates to me how low the bar really is uh, in, in terms of what people understand by leadership. Now, my, my personal experience of leadership of leadership is, uh, first of all, in a small way in politics and more latterly in business. And for me, one of the most important parts of leadership is setting the agenda. It's basically imagining the future based on the, as much knowledge of the present realities as you, can, as you can grasp. And it's always imperfect, but the essence is that you, you, you have a practical agenda based on what is going on around you. And I think that's what's absolutely missing at the moment from uh, global political leadership. Uh, and uh, in the absence of that, we are staggering into what is, I think, likely to be a major crisis of the whole of the world economy with severe consequences globally. So I would say that, that leadership now, the question of leadership, is more vital than it has been for some time. And that leadership, in, uh, in terms of what it practically would mean at the political level, would be in engaging as many people as possible in an informed public debate on the world recession and how to fix it. And that's a very uh, imminent problem which I think we all have to face. Okay. So I'm going to take a little group of uh, four, those four, and then I'll work back and I'll get you all in, yeah? Gentlemen. I just want to make one point. And it picks up on what the gentleman at the back said. One of the characters of a leader is vision. They have the need for vision and to be able to communicate that vision. But to be an effective leader, that vision has to last more than 10 minutes. I mean, preferably in a political leader for the length of time that they are in office. And it has to be based on reality. And I was in a discussion earlier that about, about professionals. And there was a lot of a comment about regulation, particularly in the teaching profession. And much of that regulation is based because somebody at the top has not actually sat down and said, what are schools for? Communicated that clearly <laughs> to the people who work in schools. And then left them to get on achieving the end, achieving the vision, in their own way, 
But instead, what we have is a government that insists on tinkering around, responding to what happens in the world, because they haven't got the, either not or been able to use intellectual capacity to have a vision which stands the test of time. Okay, thank you. And the young man there, yeah. Um, Brendan, you made the point that um, the government thinks that uh, uh, it puts too many problems of society down to those who from personal behaviour. But do you not also think that to some extent we are responsible for our personal behaviour? And that um, part of the reason at least the government throwing so many unauthoritative um, regimes at us is that it's a crisis of individual responsibility as well on the part of the general public as well. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Yeah, um, ne next person there. I think the uh, news about the army is interesting, but I really think that the army is not immune from the kind of corrosive effects that are taking place in society. I think Brendan's uh, example of vehicle club bullying is one. We can also think of the kind of dramatic increase in the kind of growing wealth in British society. And look at the numbers of kind of uh, army guys that come back, uh, suffering from post war syndrome, there seems to be no kind of medical justification for them. And uh, the man of social don't think kind of <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> And the kind of like, um, I do think ideals and ideas of leadership are kind of passe. When I was at school, when the army came to my school, they wanted you to join the young leaders. Now it's look like um, army adverts are like gap you with a gun. And I think the, the army itself is not immune from the, the, these kind of personal effects. I think it's slightly plus and over. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so the person here in the, the front row, and then, yeah, is it, are we back on? Are we on? Are we on? No. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. Okay, put that mic to one side. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is that working, yeah? Yeah. I never thought I'd say this, but thank God for the British Army um, for outlining the trinity of what leadership really means and what it's made up of. From my understanding... Major General Ritchie, of what you said. Um, you need <coughs> leadership. And as far as I can see, what you have at the minute is a government, Gordon Brown, ragbag of managers, miserable people, uninspired people, quangos, etc. You've got the lead, that's the rest of us. Um, and the task is the thing that seems to be missing from the three point equation. Um, so that gives the whole thing, the task seems to me to give the whole thing a shape. So, in the spirit of grasping the Nettle, I'd like to ask the panel what would their outline of the task in hand be and how they would go about it. Thank you for that. <laughs> you can think about that, Sorry. panel, but don't try and answer it, really. Um, these two gentlemen here... Right, when I tell these two gentlemen here, quick words in the panel, then we go back and we do all that lot, yeah? So it's the, these two gentlemen here. See you next week, yeah, but not related. Yeah, we're going. Anyway, take a lead. Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if there's an, an, uh, another paradigm for leadership because it seems very personality centred. So, for example, I, I like I, Claire's idea about ideas, in fact. So, if it is a very strong idea, could there be, like, say, co leaders? Can we, for, for example, people working in partnership to lead? Can, is, it, is it conceivable that the American presidency could be a job share, for example? So anyway, new, new paradigms. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just picking up on the thing about um, the problem being evasion of, uh, evasion of responsibility nowadays. But there, there's also a fact that would-be leaders are under an incredible amount of sophisticated attack and quite, quite carefully thought out intellectual attack of people who try and take on a leadership role. And maybe if society wants leaders, we have to also make it a bit easier for them. OK, thank you. OK, anything anyone wants to reflect on, yes, Andrew? Um, yeah. Can I, can I start by saying um, absolutely the army is not immune from this, and I hope I didn't sound in any way complacent. I mean, there have been some, some dreadful uh, instances of bullying in the army, um, which were never, never tolerated, and, 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 and certainly um, uh, you know, are, are being stamped on as hard as possible. Um, equally, the way the army, dare I say it, this country it looks after its soldiers is not as perhaps it should be, um, and, uh, and examples in the press from looking after injured soldiers, injured in mind as well as in body, as well as equipment, 
uh, you know, out in theatre are, are examples. But the army is not immune from that, and the army makes mistakes and, and hopefully learns from them. I mean, the vision point, I think, I, I mentioned, and I absolutely agree with you, uh, sir, on that. I mean, I think the danger is people are all so cynical these days. Um, a chap who used to run the prison service, Martin Neri, said to me that when he arrived, and he's not a charismatic leader, I hope he's not in the audience. <laughs> he's not a charismatic leader. But he's a but, very good leader. But he is a good leader. And when he arrived in his job, he found endless vision statements and glossy magazines. And when he went to visit individual prisons, he asked them, he asked around, you know, what do you think of this Home Office inspired vision? They'd either never heard of it or it was greeted with such hollow laughter that it was counterproductive. So I think the v vision needs to be really thought through. There does have to be an agenda, but needs to be credible, and it needs to be communicated not in a spinish way. And I think we're all enthralled to marketing people. So let's get rid of marketeer, mar marketeers as well as the Human Rights Act. Um, final point is, how, how, what, you know, what task might we set government? Well, uh, there was one minister, and I'm afraid I've forgotten uh, the, the minister's name, but it was a woman who said that she was focusing on fixing things. Fixing things. I really like that. You know, what's wrong and let's fix it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty <laughs> you'd need a bit more than that, wouldn't you? But it's the practicalities. Let's really get back, and I don't want to say back to basics, but it's fixing things. So that would be how I'd address it. OK, Brendan wants to come in. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, Andrew's confusion about the problems in the military really cuts to the chase of this discussion and the crisis of leadership. Because, you know, Andrew presents it as a kind of external threat to the military. You know, he talks about the Human Rights Act, this kind of imposition of <laughs> rights and, you know, which the military and other people have to respect. But it's not. It's much more internal than that. You know, it's, it's a real crisis of purpose in the military and not knowing what they're for or even denying their purpose. You know, as the speaker here said, the military now presents itself as this kind of humanitarian outfit. If you look at their adverts, they show people going around the world, building toilets, helping old women to cross a bridge, whatever. You know, they continually deny their central purpose, which is as a body of armed men who have to enforce uh, an occupation or fight wars or whatever. And I think, um, you know, Sarah said earlier that uh, President Bush didn't outsource things like other people have, but in fact he did, and what he outsourced was the military. If you look at Iraq, um, President Bush uh, outsourced huge amounts of work in Iraq to mercenary forces. You know, they were protecting American officials. They were fighting wars that the military itself didn't want to fight. And that was extraordinary, because what you have there is the American state outsourcing the element of state power that they used to guard jealously in the past, which was the right to use force, the right to use uh, arms. You know, the state is now even outsourcing the thing that they once guarded uh, so jealously in the past. And I think um, this really, this goes across the board. It's a crisis of purpose within institutions, in medicine, politics, the military. And, you know, uh, when Sarah talks about the collapse of uh, symbols of leadership, like the white coat in the doctor and so on, I think we have to understand that those, the falling away of those symbols follows uh, the collapse of institutions themselves rather than the other way around. Okay, Alison. Right. Um I think that one of the things that's interesting about some of the current crazy ideas about leadership is this idea that you can sort of make it horizontal. I think that is completely demented. It's also not the way that human beings behave. You know, we, we actually, we like there to be a, we, we all have societies in which there's a peak. We're interested in single combat. Um, and also there is the ultimate point that a buck has to stop. You know, let's go back to the American presidents again. Somebody has to be the point at which it's decided. However, what I do think, and, and several people remarked on this, is that actually you also have to assume that there are clear values and ways of behaving that everybody through the organization agrees on. Um, and that also goes back to something you were saying, Claire, that, I, that there is a real problem at the root of it, which is that often we don't know what our values are, we don't know what the tasks are, and that's probably one of the reasons that we refuse to take responsibility. You know, I don't know how you fix that. I mean, that's something that goes very, very deep. But I, I do also want to come back to what seems to me to be at the root of our feeling that we lack leadership. And it is the lack of responsibility that people elsewhere in the organization will take. And, and I've said that that's a lot to do with the fact that we've created organizations in which it's very hard to take responsibility. But I think it also does go further. It's a bit like you were saying with the BBC, that you, know, you can't imagine people behaving like this in the BBC in which members of my family used to work. 
work, um, that they could have been so indifferent to the values of what was going on. And again, to take another example that Brendan gave, since you mentioned Liam Donaldson, um, you know, there was this absolute it's worse than a fiasco. People's lives were ruined, are still being ruined by the, the mess over junior doctor training. And essentially, nobody resigned. Well, two people did. They were both doctors who'd been seconded into it and who felt themselves to be primarily professionals and not members of the civil service, and they did resign. Nobody at the top resigned. And I do think that that has a lot to do with the way organisations are set up. But it also has to do with the fact that you can't lead people if there are no deeply felt, shared, internalised values. OK, thanks. OK, Sarah, I, I, anything you want to pick up on? I just want to see you what's coming next. But anything you want to pick up on? I'm just, uh, just uh, relating to the task um, and uh, what we need to mend the country and so on, I was just going to say that um, one always has to remember society being a sort of living organism. When we had the best leader in memory, you know, Churchill, we then chucked him out, of course. And so I think... Um, um, I'm rather sort of optimistic that, that society corrects itself. I think even the financial crisis, you're seeing, you know, strangely more people giving to charity. And that's, you know, maybe we kind of sort ourselves out okay, without um, leaders. <laughs> OK, so I've got, I've got a threesome there, and then I've got a lady there, and then a gentleman there. So that will do. Yeah, so you first, so yeah. Um, OK, for, for the last three years, uh, I taught British military officers at Shrivenham, which is the place they go to... 10 years after they've passed out from Sandhurst, if Andrew has correctly identified their skill set. Now, the, the, one, the one thing I would add to, to some of this discussion is that to, to have a set of shared values in a core or group of people takes time. And it's actually not something that is readily inculcated, however hard we try, in a short period of time. It actually comes from an absorption of broader social values and a social aim and purpose. And that is the problem that the military uh, most clearly are suffering from at the moment. In an age where the military could cut itself off from society and put all of its men in barracks and keep them there, it could pursue that project over a long period of time. But now, increasingly, the military are part of society and they absorb and reflect the cultural confusions of society in every single way. We see now officers who are blaming and claiming the Ministry of Defence for having exposed them to risk, soldiers taking mobile phones and cameras into combat without any apparent awareness of the problems that that might create. And just to finish on one note in relation to bullying, possibly, you know, a deep cut, we have now had 16 inquiries, 16 inquiries, including a review of the reinvestigation of all of the previous investigations into what went on at Deep Cut. That speaks volumes as to uh, an institution that is also confused and has absorbed cultural confusion. OK, thank you very much. Now, there's a, a, a person sitting next to them and then there's a young man in front. Yeah. Um, for me, the standout thing about the um, contestants, the, the, the real personalities of the American leadership contest, uh, Barack Obama and Sarah Palin, uh, as they contest for leadership, it's precisely they're there because of their lack of experience of leadership. She's been in Alaska, and he's proud to say in his biography, The Audacity of, of Hope, that he's been protected and cocooned from the contestation uh, with, with opposing ideas with the Republican Party by being part of the uh, Democratic heartland in, in Chicago and that machine. So it's their very uh, lack of fitness, um, which their lack of being discredited with, with old uh, forms of leadership that seems to fit them for the task ahead, but they have not, not defined that task. I mean, they have the very low expectations of tackling the, the economic crisis, which I'm not meant to mention, but all they're going to do uh, is raise teacher salaries like that's going to help it. So the only element left then of, Andrew, your leadership trinity is us, the people who are to be led. And I think the danger is that when we find we're going to be misled, we're going to be pretty depressed. <laughs> OK, uh, person uh, just in front, yeah? Hi. Um, one of the most interesting things that I felt came out of the immigration debate yesterday was the fact that Frank, P Frank Field, the um, Labour MP, instead of making the, the positive case for controls on immigration, he kept referring back to the idea that his, his, it was popular with his constituents. And he just, instead of trying to positively make the case, trying to support the idea of um, controlled immigration as an idea, he just kept referring back to this consensus which supposedly couldn't be challenged by vision or leadership. So we get the sort of situation where our politicians just become administrators. They just sort of 
leech off the, the zeitgeist without actually creating ideas and creating new visions. And, yeah. Very interesting point there. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's, there's, there's that lady there and then that gentleman behind, the next two I saw, yeah? Go back to this point about taking responsibility, which does seem to me to be, well, my, my background is education, and I was very aware as a head teacher when things changed, and I knew what my responsibilities were initially. And then there was this big change. I used to be in charge of the curriculum, I used to be leading um, teachers to talk about the curriculum and write about education. Suddenly, I became somebody who began to negotiate contracts with cleaners, uh, caretakers. Caterers. It was as if my job was sort of lost and spread out, and my responsibilities became so diffuse that you lost that sense of, of leadership, really, because you tried to do things that were terribly fair. And you need the confidence, really, as I know you're doing something that you're good at. But I perceive it as a different policy to actually diffuse, to make people do things that weren't really. They Sarah, did you want to make that point? Yeah. I was going to say, I think that's absolutely right. And we saw that happen in the health service where everyone was given these the, the sort of displacement jobs so that, you know, no one was actually doing what they were meant to be doing. And it is, I don't, I know it is interesting the motivation for that. I think you're right. Okay, right. Now, um, so last few, and I, I think I've seen... So, that gentleman there... Right, but keep your hands off, so I can't see him. Yeah, so you speak, so, yeah. Um, there were just two things on political leadership, which um, I haven't heard from the panel, but I think exhibit some of the broader problems, where we have two kind of developed, two developments of political leadership that are very sinister, I think, and reactions to the kind of technocratic, managerial form of leadership that predominates at the moment. And those two sinister forms, one is we do have some kind of decisive leadership, you know, like George Bush was satirised by the Daily Show as a great decider, but he just made his decisions on the basis that God speaks to him. In the same way that Tony Blair, when he said, I'm going into Iraq because I believe it's the right thing to do, my inner voice, my, you know, ethical conscience tells me that we must override the will of the British people and take us into a war. And so you have, in reaction to this kind of technocratic leadership, you also have another way of evading responsibility by these beautiful souls who can exempt themselves from the idea that they're accountable, particularly political leaders who kind of try to demonstrate their decisiveness by showing that they're above democracy and above the rest of us. And the other form as well, which I think is probably going to be increasingly important in relation to the current economic downturn, is you've got the rise of populism as well, and populist leaders like uh, York Heidel, most obviously, but also across the world. Um, in France, you know, in Venezuela, wherever, we have people who are able to kind of ride the waves of frustration at, at, and re- in reaction against kind of consensual politics, but without actually being able to translate any of those sentiments into some kind of uh, constituency or um, substantial changes in the uh, political order of things. Thank you, very useful. Right, okay, where, where are we? Hands up again. So I've lost. Yes, so that person there, I can't see. Yes, you. And then, uh, then you, then you. And then I'll probably have to bring the panel in. Yes. Um, how important do you think uh, historical narrative is to the Belizean a sense of history? It seems that one thing that the Belizeans today don't talk about is the development of society in the past up to the present in order to demonstrate how they can build on that into the future. It seems to be almost an estrangement from the past. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the development of roads or um, an air, you know, airport infrastructure. There's no recognition of the achievements of a, of a road network um, or the development of an airport infrastructure. So how, how, how can that be built in the future? Thank you. Good question. Right, where, where are we? Um, yes, so, wait, sorry, we're up here. This uh, young man here, then, then there, yeah? And I think that's what... Br- oh, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, then, John. I have a bit of Just a question there. to the panel. Over, um, we've constantly had a discussion about when one should and should not resign. And I was thinking, rather than just 
having resignations for failing in a certain aspect. What about resignation over others' failure to do something? And obviously a very recent example of that would be David Davis, who obviously only resigned from the shadow cabinet. However, a very important resignation nonetheless, and an example of when the paradox of giving up leadership in order to lead um, hasn't been addressed, but it still um, offers a very strong example of this, is uh, General Dannant, who um, obviously um, is leading the way from within the ranks. Should one um, give up leadership to lead um, when they don't have direct control, or should we lead from within? Oh, very good question. Right. Um, the panel can't answer all these questions, obviously. Right, that person there, then there, then there, and then there, just there, then. Yeah, and that's it. Some poor sap has to read American management literature textbooks, and that, that's me. Um, if you go back to the 90s, you'll find there was the cult of the celebrity CEO. There's also the cult of the team. But generally, the celebrity CEO, even Al Chainsaw Dunlap at Sunbeam, who went around with the chainsaw to the workforce, that was up until 9-11, really, and the collapse of the dot-com boom. Um, that was the way to go. Now, since that time, as I'm sure the panelists will know, Warren Bennis, the doyen of American leadership studies, published Geeks and Geezers, where he coined a word, neoteny, which is broadly something horrible that happened to you in childhood, usually abuse. And he said that leaders were really people who'd successfully struggled against child abuse. And the other thing was, of course, Daniel Goleman, uh, made even more money after emotional intelligence with emotional leadership. And Andrew, I've got a question for you. You say that, you know, I'm with you on the human rights people. I, spending my time with marketing people, I'd like to exterminate them. <laughs> but uh, would you not agree when you speak of empathy and when you miss the point that the corrosion that our friend there was talking about of the military was not too much bullying, but rather too many inquiries about bullying, um, would you not agree that along with the marketing men, therapists are people who the military doesn't need, now has, and maybe that's why they don't know which way is up anymore. Okay, uh, one, one more there, one, final point there, then me, then the panel in the reverse order. Thank you. I think uh, part of the definition about leadership, given it is so complex and so many different things to different people, I think one of the reasons we abilities to define it is not by what it is, but what it is not. And I think the thing that we see about what it is not mainly is around hypocrisy. So therefore, lawmakers shouldn't be lawbreakers. Uh, the general soldiers can't not be able to defend a village or fire a gun. Uh, priests should not fiddle with little boys. You know, there's a bunch of things about what they shouldn't be, and we hold them up quickly to be able to respond and say, we'll kill, pull you down if you do what the community expects you not to do. And they're different things for different, the values are different for different industries. Uh, you know, the, the, the head of WWF should not wear fur, yet another leader can. Uh, and the challenge for leadership is to be able to be able to understand what it is, is the community expects. And those things will change quickly and may change fast. And the challenge is to always be ahead of what you cannot be. And I think that's one of the challenges of leadership today. Thank you very much, everyone. Some very useful contributions to the floor. Before I get the panel, of course, I want to say something. Um, I, just, I was really struck, um, actually, by the, the point uh, that was made about Frank Field hiding behind saying, you know, it's, it's just what the constituents want rather than making a positive case against mass immigration. Um, and one of the themes of the Battle of Ideas actually been another one which we're frequently hearing now, which is the evidence shows which is also a kind of way of not arguing your case, which sort of almost say scientific evidence shows this, so there's no argument, then it's the end of that. So there is a sense in which, in politics at least, we're increasingly finding people um, not prepared to make a positive case for and persuade, and that presumably, and that is the kind of thing that you would need to do to be a leader. You have to persuade people to follow you around something. If you just say, look, you have to do it, that doesn't really work, which is why, in a way, the army doesn't quite work as an example. But the broader point is, is that there has to be an idea of the army that you join. Then once you join, you follow. Well, you can't just go around telling people what to do and they do it unless they know why. Obviously, that is dictatorial and that is bad. I mean, you know, you don't want people to just be um, mindlessly following. You want them to be following something that they clearly understand. And I think that's what um, our leaders won't do. They're not, they won't win the arguments with people. 
I, I, I thought the question about the sense of history is very important for this, for this reason, at, at least, which is, is that I, one of the things that I think is most disturbing is that in some ways um, people who are experienced are completely disregarded and people are considered to be you know, exciting if they're new and they've got no experience. And there's obviously the chasing of youth that we've talked about, but there's no sort of sense of standing on the shoulders of giants or you know, any kind of sense of, kind of you know, building on a tradition and we're constantly being told that we have, you know, we have to kind of keep up with the, you know, the world's changing, knowledge economy, everything's changing, we've got to keep up in order to be on top of everything. Which I do think kind of gives, that sort of atmosphere feeds into this sort of idea of leadership skills, these generic skills. Because in that sort of atmosphere, in a way, all you have to do is to kind of go on a skills course, gather the skills, and you can lead anything. Because it's actually, subs- it just means absolutely nothing. Which is why, actually... When I was teaching in further education, the guy who came in as, a, as the person to run the college and, work, and run a supermarket before, they knew absolutely nothing about education at all. People who run hospitals have come from industry, and, you know, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's assumed that as long as they're leaders, it doesn't matter. There's sort of the, co- the content's not there. The reason why I think that relates to a sense of history is because it's almost as though you've just got to be a leader for now of the thing that's there. And it just seems to me that process has started to win out. And my, my final point, um, it, it, I suppose, is just in relation to Obama, um, who does look as though he's likely to be elected, is, is that, you know, in a way, Obama, for me, is... I mean, I want him to be the great leader. And I think there is, I put in the brochure blurb, you know, there is a sort of yearning. You know, I really, I really want there to be some great political leaders because I really think that, you know, the world faces and confronts some serious problems. But I, I, I have to say that I do feel as though it's kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's Mac leadership. It's a bit like Brennan said. He, he doesn't read the same press release out. But actually, I can't tell the difference politically between Obama and McCain's politics. It's a style thing. And therefore, I know that he's absolutely inspiring. But in the end, I don't want to be fooled just because I've had better spin. And I do think that is a really serious crisis because what we want is great leaders. But what for? Not just because we want to follow great leaders, because we're all lunatics and we just kind of want to be inspired, in which case we would just go and join some happy, clappy church. Because we want people to lead us through what we know is a very, very difficult time. So I, in the end, I don't think it's a crisis of leadership at all. It's a crisis of ideas. Um, but I just thought I'd organise a session to sort of check. Um, but anyway... Uh. In, rever- in reverse order... <laughs> in reverse order, um, can uh, Sarah's final thoughts, please? Uh, well, if I could just respond to it was the the, um, the question about sort of moral leadership, about whether you give up power in order um, to lead. And I think you know the only thing one has to be aware of is is vanity. That actually you know adoration is quite a corrupting thing. If you remember about David Davis, one thing that was puzzling about it was that he was a member of the opposition, and the opposition all agreed with him. <laughs> so it was a sort of rather peculiar, rather peculiar resignation. Um, and and w- we know though you know when you see someone genuinely um, hand over power. I mean. Bless was someone who said that you know he was going to give up because to, to keep to keep on with the power was rather like sort of Gollum and the Ring, you know that it in itself it was a dangerous thing. But we know you know he was being shoved out by Gordon Brown. So uh, you know the, the cases are sort of far and um, if you do, uh, Tim Collins is another example. You know fabulous leadership. Was it vanity um, or was it real leadership? Thank you, Andrew. I couldn't I couldn't possibly comment on Tim <laughs> Collins. Um, can, can I make one, with, uh, with apologies, one comment in answer to, the, to, to the, a number about the military crisis of confidence, and then perhaps a completely new comment. Um, I, I mean, I, I, do, I, do, I do acknowledge what people have said about the military and without wishing to hijack it. I, I think that there has been a real, uh, a, 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 a genuine um, um, concern in the military as to whether... Um, the people of this country, uh, uh, who, after all, they are there to serve. I mean, at the end of the day, and Brendan is absolutely right, um, the, uh, an, an army exists for situations which are nationally life-threatening um, and to be the, the force of ultimate recourse. Um, 
when, when a, 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 the, the Queen's um, democratically elected First Minister sends um, uh, the British Army to Iraq, which is not necessarily uh, a nationally life-threatening uh, uh, operation, and when um, the vast majority of the people of this country are clearly opposed to the war, what, 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 what is political opposition very quickly spills over into opposition or is perceived by the, by the soldiers to see it spilling over into opposition to the military themselves. And this, is, this is a, you know, has been a very serious effect. Um, I think that, together with a raft of legislation that's come in over the last tw uh, 10 years or a dozen years, um, which has had a pretty profound effect on the military as well. The military, ha the military force has to be robust. I mean, it has to be robust. It has to be fair and straight and honest. It has to be robust. And when the provisions of the, uh, of the Disability Discrimination Act are applied to the armed forces, and I make no c comment at all about disabled people, but it's, the, the world is turned upside down. Um, so I, I just make, offer those comments. Um, there is a thing called the Military Covenant, which is not spoken about much. Which is, which is, which is a, 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 an unwritten thing between the people of this country and its armed forces, um, which I think should be talked about more. My, my one new comment, one yeah. new idea, is that if we're going to have good political leaders, we need, it seems to me, uh, to encourage the best in this country to, um, to, to stand for Parliament, and we need the media to be slightly less intrusive <laughs> into their lives, otherwise we will continue to get rather second-rate people. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Andrew's going to give us a whole manifesto, you know, it's kind of building up. A boy's human rights act, no intrusive media. Um, OK, Alison, your final thoughts. Um, well, I don't fortunately have to read the American private sector management books in which people are coining things in order to make money because I stick to public sector, but there is a continuity, and it's this idea of generic skills, and actually they're nonsense in all contexts. They're, they're also nonsense in the private sector, this idea that somebody can just come into a business of which they know nothing and automatically be a great CEO is, you know, happens as little in the private sector as it does in the public sector. Um, but it also, I think, relates to your point about, first of all, about not having ideas, but also, I think, about the, the situation in which you find yourself. And so I want to just sort of s finish with Abraham Lincoln, actually. Because when Abraham Lincoln was elected, there were lots of people who thought it didn't really matter who won that election because nothing was going to happen in the next four years. Um, <laughs> and so it is about whether or not people <coughs> find themselves in a situation where their style of leadership actually works, and you don't know that till afterwards. I mean, you know, we, there was nothing inevitable about the fact that the North won and that the United States became united, anything, any more than there was anything inevitable about, you know, the, the, the Americans having elected the right person for the right time. Um, but it does come back to the point that you made, which I actually agree with, which is that if there are no clear values attached to people when they start off, then when things turn up which are actually demanding and difficult, they will not know how to behave in a positive fashion, and therefore they will revert to what is, I suppose, the most fundamental impulse of human beings, which is just self-protection. Thank you very much, Alison. Brendan, your final thoughts? Uh, uh, yeah, on uh, uh, Frank Field and, uh, you know, using his constituents in a disingenuous way, you see that kind of thing all the time now with the, the government continually launches consultation procedures, online petitions, focus groups, and it's a, really, it's a real kind of faux form of engagement, you know, because if, if the focus group or the petition ignore, uh, d disagrees with government policy, they simply ignore it. And, you know, consultation is seen as a kind of really democratic thing these days. It's seen as being more democratic than top-down leadership. But, in fact, consultation is better suited to monarchy, really, and to the forms of deference that Sarah was talking about earlier, whereas leadership, which is about engaging people in a debate and uh, convincing them of your ideas and getting them on board, is really the essence of uh, democracy. So I think leadership is entirely compatible. The, the two, I think the two leaders today who sum up the problem we face is, firstly, Obama and secondly, Al Gore. You know, Obama is all about style, inexperience, charisma. You know, we're expected to have faith in him, effectively. And Al Gore is all about science, as Claire was saying, evidence, you know, using facts to get us to change our behaviour. And we're expected to accept his truth. 
But leadership is not about um, having faith in someone in some religious fashion or accepting someone's scientific truth. It's about engaging people in a proper debate about where they want to go in the future. And that's the kind of thing we need. So if we want a serious debate about leadership, I think we need to inject some ideas and uh, some belief back into public life. Okay, can we thank our uh, panel, please?